Thanks. Hello. Good to Hi. see you guys again. Um, so, uh, Stephen, I was wondering if maybe you'd like to begin by sort of talking about the inspiration for this film. Um, did you like it? Yeah. Oh, good. Cool. Oh, no, I don't need applause. I was just curious if you liked it. Um, uh, what was I thinking? Um, The original conception of this film, it was gonna, I think it was going to be more of like a Chicago storefront theater. And I, and I think my first thought was that they would be doing an adaptation, a stage adaptation of The Exorcist. And then, but c because I started thinking about, um, so basically if you're like a theater person, which I'm not really anymore, I mean I occasionally dabble in it, but like, you know, if you're a theater person, what's sort of exciting about doing theater is, um, you're evoking ghosts, you know? So you like the ghosts of history, the ghosts of fiction, the ghosts of, you know, like that's what you do. You put on a play, you evoke sort of spirits, you evoke characters that aren't really there, you create an experience, not unlike, I guess, like church or something. But, um, but I started thinking about demons and ghosts in the theater and how maybe, you know, and it, it was exciting to me, like maybe blurring the line, you know, between the literal and the figurative, like, you know, how real could we get in terms of the ghost and the demons that the people are dealing with without without actually doing like a horror film? Um, and then it, and then I started thinking about this is so like convoluted and com complicated. But th but then I started thinking about like um, then one day I was thinking about just John Hughes movies and how and how like the stakes are really high, but the treatment of them is really sort of like accessible and traditional, you know, pop songs and stuff. So then I started thinking about like, you know, what if you had like a John Hughes movie that was scored musically like a horror film? Because to me that seemed actually more accurate um, to our sort of, the sort of high stakes game of college and coming of age. Um, so I guess it was a combination, it was that, that original idea turned into something a little more like a tonal experiment, like seeing if I could get away with doing like a Breakfast Club that was scored like a horror movie. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. I think so, Great. absolutely. But I'm a little off the yes. reservation these days, so. Um, so <laughs> but, it is, but it is unique in that like, you know, a lot of times the inspiration for a film is a story you want to tell, but in this case it was almost like a feeling I wanted to evoke, which is unique to this project for me. What, what feeling would you say that is? You had to sort of sum that up. Um, I just wanted to see if I could pull off this thing of like, I mean, was anyone disappointed that it like wasn't a horror film? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just wanted to like be, be able to pull off a sort of heightened haunting tone without feeling any obligation to turn it into a horror film, I guess. So, haunt, haunted? Haunted? Yes, haunting. haunting. In my, my drunken notes last night, I wrote that. Is this film haunted? Yes, if you weren't here beforehand, he, dr he drank and wept last night. That's what he yes. did overnight. <laughs> Which is not an unusual occurrence, but um, <laughs> taking notes to a wonderful film alongside that is, is certainly, certainly adds quite a bit to. Um, so I, I have a question for you um, in general. Something that struck me, um, when I was sort of watching this film, you know, I, I'm so assuming as well, we have a lot of sort of creatives in this audience, people who are, are filmmakers or some theater majors perhaps, um, and just people who are creative in general. Um, and that is something that I, I, I think is, is perhaps a theme of this film and a question to you. Do you feel that art is a sort of means of redemption? <laughs> um. Uh, I don't know. Redemption's a big word. I just think things are like, I just think things are either meaningful to us or they're not. And, uh, you know, that's what I think. I mean, I, you know, I don't think William, you know, William Peters in the movie has spent, you know, 40 years writing books. And I don't know that he's, he's not, 
He said, has not been redeemed, you know? What about and Holly, though, right? I mean, is, I mean, what does this sort of represent for her, you know, her sort of set up in the beginning of the film? I, you know, for me, it's the movie is sort of like in brackets. Do you know what I'm saying? So, like, um, they all uh, do this thing, and they have, uh, you know, it's probably like a four or five week rehearsal process, and it's meaningful to them, and they'll take it, you know, I don't, and they'll probably each take different things from it. I don't know that any of them are like profoundly changed or like redeemed by it, but I do think. Um, there's something special about it. Maybe they're all, I'm interested in like little shifts. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in baby steps. Sure. So hopefully they've taken a, ba a bunch of baby steps or one big baby step. Except I don't know that William Peters, I don't know. I don't know what his deal is. Or like, you know, or, or well, no, I mean, I don't know like what it did for him. I think it was meaningful for him that other people were engaging in his work but I don't know how changed he is by it. I hope he's fine. I hope he just goes home and like chills out or has a <laughs> cup of coffee or something, you know? Or sure. if he drinks, it's just like, oh my God, thanks, thank God it's over. But he's, he's sort of an interesting figure, right, in this sort of regard because, um, you know, this is to a certain extent a film about family, right? And, and mm. a, a play about a family, a very interesting, dysfunctional family of a certain kind. And yet there's also you know, the, the, the characters' families that they all, in mm. one form or another, reference either implicitly or explicitly. Mm. But then there's a third family, which is the fam family of the, the sort of theater, right? The, 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 the troupe that's putting on a production that, that becomes a family. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could sort of talk about in what ways, because I've seen it in some of your other work as well, the role that family plays in sort of shaping us, both the family that we are born with and the family that we sort of collect. Right? Yeah. I'm really. I'm actually really glad you you brought that up. Um, people say that a lot. And they don't mean it, but I actually mean that. Um, uh, no, I always said that, that I felt like this was a movie about parents and children, like that, and I still feel that way. And I don't know. I, you know, I I would be happy if maybe like forty percent of the audience agrees with me. Like I'd be happy with that. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it, but it's interesting too that like you don't meet the parents until the end. I don't know. I, everyone in this movie uh, is the way they are or is affected in an emotional or spiritual way by how they were raised or who their parents were. You kind of have to watch closely to pick that up. Um, I would look at you more if I could see you. I just want you to know that. Um, I mean, I can see you. Um, so I'll look at you more. And no, you all are so beautiful, um, by the way. Consider. And multicolored. Um, uh, um, primary cut, some primary colors. Primary colors are underrated. Um, uh, no, but I think we're all, we are the way we are because of our parents. But yeah, but the parents aren't in the movie. But I think there's a conversation between, if, unless I'm mistaken, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's a conversation Every single character in the film has a conversation about parents, I think. Maybe the professor doesn't, you know? What but is, I think what's wrong the, with that? I yeah. think, but I think all the, uh, I think I remember writing it and thinking I, that I wanted that to be true. So hopefully it didn't get cut. Um, yeah, that's important. That's what it's about. I mean, you know, the family thing. I didn't think so much about the family of the theater community just because, I mean, they're a family, but they're just, they're all alone. You know what I'm saying? Like we're ever it's like it's college. You're alone. I mean, you're just trying to you're just trying you're just trying to figure out you're just trying to figure out what who what what some I, of us right? You know, but you know what I'm saying, right? It's like you might be in a group of friends, but you're also like 19, 20, 21. You're not really in a group. You're in your head. You are you guys in your head right now? Um, and yes. This, it's it's funny because. You, I would agree with you on that wholeheartedly. Um, you mentioned that, you know, because you just, you had mentioned to, to me before the show that you had just actually gone back and sort of visited your hometown. Yes. Yes, and, and that sort of reliving, again, I guess, the, the ghosts of what you were sort of 
right, haunted by with college. Yeah, yeah, right? but minor correction, because I told you I hadn't been back in 12 years. It wasn't my hometown, it was my college town. So college town. it's not that I haven't been home for, I go home quite a bit. So I didn't want you to think I'd been estranged from my family for 12 years. <laughs> um, I, no, 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 I took this movie this past weekend to the University of South Carolina, where I went to school. And, uh, and that's where this stuff happened. And uh, it was really moving to me to do that. And, and I was nervous because I'm 34, so I'm 12 years out of college. Um, and I was showing it to college students. So, and, uh, but like in South Carolina, and um, I was worried that it would just evoke nothing and that it would just be like, you know, like I was like showing them like Little House on the Prairie or something, you know? <laughs> and um, and uh, they were all, they, you know, they recognized moments and it meant a lot to me. Was we literally showed it on the stage where I had my, like I had my f my first like kiss with a person in a rehearsal like Madeline did, and uh, I didn't burst into tears, um, <laughs> nor did it feel v that big of a deal to me. But um, we showed it on the stage where that happened, where I had the kiss. Um, so that was wild. <laughs> um, in that regard, right? Um, since we're on the sort of subject of kissing, uh, kissing. Yeah, um, uh, you know, there's a really powerful scene in this film involving Madeline, right, mm -hmm. and and sort of her journey, whether through the from the first kiss to sort of that that really powerful scene with her and Holly. And actually, I, I also think a very funny scene with Holly, where Holly's trying to tell her it's not a big deal, right, to just bury take yourself, take off your clothes, right, to bury yes. yourself and take off your clothes, and then. William Peters, Austin. It's easy Middleton for Holly to say. In. Yeah, absolutely. It's easy for Holly to say, right? But there's something in that scene that, that really struck me. And I, I wasn't crying. I, I was really actually like happy about it. Um, that Holly you says... You be happy and cry at the same time. That's true. That's true. There were a few moments where I cried uh, positively. I cried in watching this film because there were moments of, of sheer, in my opinion, perfection in sort of the tone and the movement and the time and the delivery and just that, that cohesion and I'm gushing on you. That's, and I'd rather get to That's fine. I'd rather get to a I'd rather get to a question. No, but what are you saying? What I'm what I'm asking, what I'm trying to ask, right, is about this scene where um, Holly's imploring Madeline to bear herself, mm. right? And to show herself. Mm. And Madeline is sort of struggling with that concept of sort of Bearing herself, right? Yes. And so I'm wondering, you know, because Madeline seems to be a very sort of vulnerable character, right? Do you see a sort of a sort of correlation? I felt throughout this whole film, not just Madeline and Holly in this scene, this idea of bearing yourself, but creatively bearing yourself. Do you see a sort of vulnerability in creative expression of bearing yourself? Uh. I don't know that I maybe I maybe I was thinking about that in the back of my head. For me, uh, can I take use that as a springboard to jump? Go where the hell you want. Okay, no, no. But it, you know, okay. So you're bringing up a question about Madeline and Holly. Like to me, I always saw them as sort of correlative, sort of like yin and yang, because I didn't want it to be a movie in which it was like all of your answers are in your. Uh, willingness and ability to take off all your clothes. You know, like, that's what I didn't want it to be. So, to me, like, Madeline has a lot of, like, spiritual stuff together, but isn't physically comfortable. And then Holly has sex all the time, apparently. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but is not spiritually or, or is psychologically quite as healthy as she would like to be. So, you know, I guess I see them as sort of a yin and, the, and a yang in terms of Spiritual yearning, sexual yearning, ideally they're sort of combined into one person. Holly says something in that scene, right, that, you know, she's sort of, um, um, when she's imploring Madeline mm. to, to, to bear herself, to take off her clothes, that, that people want you to think that your body is evil, yes. right, on this sort of spiritual level. Yes. And what I'm wondering is, in general, and you've mentioned cer certainly in the past in interviews, um, that... Um, jokingly at the Chicago Film Festival recently that all your films are about sex and faith, yes. right? Um, they are. <laughs> they sure are. Um, that, that we live in a society that, that does, to a certain extent, not just on a religious level, 
sort of try and impart on us that, that bodies are evil. In other words, that is there a double standard in our, in our country, certainly as a filmmaker and a film thinker and a, and a, and a film scholar, right, and just a, just a person with eyes and ears, that there's a double standard in terms of, of how this country views bodies. Yeah, totally. I mean, how many of you growing up were told to close your eyes for a sex scene, but not for a scene of violence? You know, I mean, that's the country we live in. So um, has that changed? Am I wrong? Right, yes. Um, so um, yeah, no, and my dad is, I'm sure we'll get into this maybe, but my dad's a Southern Baptist minister in South Carolina. And uh, so I come from that world of, um, it's okay to watch people's heads getting blown off, but far be it, um, uh, you know, that, that a 14 year old sees a man and a woman in, in a, physical embrace. Um, yeah. What is the question? <laughs> I, oh, do I see a, pro oh, is there a problem of repression in America? Is yeah, that what sure. it is? Sure. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, probably. But may, I don't know. Maybe it's just a Southern thing. I don't know. Um, but certainly I'm fascinated in a religious culture in which um, people are not encouraged to be comfortable with themselves physically. And um, that apparently has like, you know, been enough fuel f to, f you know, to uh, carry me along for a decade. So do you, so do you think that um, Americans have an, un well, I guess this, maybe a, this is a big ass question, huh? But do, do you think that we in America right now, we have a very unhealthy relationship with sex? That is a big ass question. question. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, it, it, it's, it's really hard for me to take myself out of a, my own personal religious context. Do you know what I'm saying? So, like, um, I mean, we live in Chicago. We live in an urban environment. Uh, most of my friends are completely okay with sex. So we are probably talking about urban versus rural and religious versus secular. Um, Things that you have certainly addressed. Yeah, but I don't know that America at large has a problem with. I just think America has a uh, ADD problem, <laughs> but that's a very different thing. <laughs> sure, sure, right. Um, I, I I certainly think that your films, right, in dealing with this issue of, of of sex and faith, you know, wind up with these sort of really interesting collisions. Even your most recent film at, at the Chicago Film Festival, which I saw, was sort of yes. dealing with that, that difficulty. And you have said in the past that in many respects you make personal films. Yes. So would you say that this is an issue that is very personal to you? And yeah, it so is, because this is the thing. Like, we're only here on Earth like a few minutes, right? So what does it mean to be discouraged from actually living in and appreciating your body? I mean, it seems to me like a total waste. So um, there's these, and, and, and the Southern Baptist uh, denomination is the largest Protestant organization in the United States of America. So um, that means there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people encouraged to place their focus and attention on their soul and what happens next and what's going to happen in the next life and not getting any wisdom, feedback, encouragement about how to actually live in your body and engage with other physical human beings. So this is a major problem, and I guess that's why I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> mm. um, what do you think? I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a film thinker that I really dig. His name is um, Alain Badiou, and he's a French philosopher who has sort of published some, some books on cinema. And he, he claims, well, one of his statements claims a lot, you know, the French, um, <laughs> <laughs> that... Um, Cinema, right, is creating new ideas about what an idea is. And I see a lot of that in your work, you know, not just in, in terms of, you know, dealing with issues of faith and sex, but even in terms of, 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 you know, what a narrative could or should be. I mean, you've talked about the difficulty that you think some people have with black box. And I guess to that end, right, to what extent has cinema taught you things, right? Has given you new perspectives. And as a filmmaker, is that something that, that you, you seek to use, uh, you know, your creative expression for? Um, okay. Um, yes. 
<laughs> no, 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 I think, um, um, yeah, yeah? I'm not going to help you out on this. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know what to say. If it's a, does cinema, like, does it matter? Do I think that, you know? Well, I guess it's maybe a more broad, uh, well, maybe a more personal question in terms of what drew you to cinema, right? You have ideas, right? So what brought you to filmmaking? As you said, you didn't go to film school, right? He didn't go to film school, just so you all know. So what inspired you to seek out cinema as a means of expression? Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, um, that's I don't, probably a more practical way of putting the question, I suppose. Um, okay. Th yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, no, no, no. I'm a lifelong, uh, and I'm constantly sort of like um, people because I dabbled in Chicago theater between 2004 and 2009, and um, so I'm constantly trying to push against this idea that I come to film by way of theater. But I don't know, I don't know. I, but I was a, like a freakishly weird cinephile when I was a child. And, um, and I knew, like, I was the kind of guy who, like, I could have told you names of composers and editors and stuff like that when I was, like, eight, nine, ten years old. Um, I don't know why cinema matters, but it always has. And um, so it's not that I came to movies by way of theater, it's that I came to theater by way of cinema and then back into cinema by way of maturity and realizing <laughs> and realizing that it's actually doable because film is doesn't seem very accessible to most people until they realize how little you need or you know um, i i yeah cinema is the most it's you know it's always been the most important thing in my life and it still is um, and i mean it, it like i wake up thinking about it it's like coffee. It, well, no, it's not, because I drink coffee, too. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, I don't know, a croissant. Sure. <laughs> not to bring the French back into it. But, um, you can always bring the French into it with me. Yes. It's fine. No, no, it is great. It matters, it matters to me a lot. It matters to me a lot. So as, as and this is something that we were, we were sort of, um, we were talking about as well, and, and you certainly expressed that you hope to get there, which is that, you know, as a sort of local you know, Chicago, sort of independent filmmaker. I know all these, those labels sometimes are kind of like, they just smack okay. of sort of, you know, but... but um, you, you didn't say indie, so it's all okay. I, I didn't. Some people do around here. But um, I was wondering if you could maybe impart some of those sort of maybe more, more practical war stories about, you know, what it takes, and you sort of mentioned this in the back, and here we have a whole audience of, of people who are, are hoping to, to go out there, I would assume, many of you anyway, to express themselves through cinema... And certainly there's nobody standing around offering you $10 million to make film. Thank you, Paula Wagner. But um, I'm wondering if you could, could sort of share some of those experiences that, that you sort of had mentioned to me, you know, offhandedly uh, in terms of what it takes to sort of, you know, what, what are some things you're going to be encountering? You know? mm -hmm. um, so you're asking me about just the journey? The journey? Is yeah, that what give about? us the journey. Um, your journey? Uh, so, um, I've been in Chicago for 10 years. 2005, um, I was at a day job and I called my dad at lunch and I said, I'm gonna make my first short film this, this summer and I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but it's about time. I was 24. Uh, but so, in starting in 2005, I just sort of like jumped off the cliff and started making my own movies with no film education. And I've basically made one movie per year since for the last nine years, and um, uh, and uh, it was a, a incredible, frightening, um, patience-inducing journey. I mean, so I st I was making like I made two shorts, a medium-length feature that was an hour long, and a full-length feature that was an hour and twenty minutes. Um, between 2005 and 2010 with no luck, like no success. And then in 2010, I, um, I made The Wise Kids, which is a coming of age movie that I made um, in Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm from, but was actually a hybrid Chicago-Charleston production. So I shot this movie about teenagers in the Bible Belt called The Wise Kids. We shot it in Charleston. We lived at my parents' house. Um, but it was half cast and crewed out of Chicago, half cast and crewed 
out of South Carolina. So this big sort of Midwestern, Southern hybrid thing in my hometown. Um, and that was the movie that, that really hit and did well for me and gave me whatever legitimacy I have now. And, um, but that was, you know, five years and thousands of dollars spent trying to make a works of genius or whatever. Um, and uh, so that was important. Um, and then 2000 and um, so Wise Kids, you know, it did well and we got a theatrical release and we were a New York Times critics pick and we played like 60 festivals and we had theatrical distribution in New York and Chicago. We were on a bunch of top 10 of 2011 lists distribution. So it's on Netflix and iTunes and Hulu Plus and Amazon Prime and all that stuff. Small movie, 90 minutes, kids in the South dealing with everything we've been talking about. Um, but it took forever and, you know, sort of like all logic dictated that I should have stopped before then. You know, I feel like that happens a lot. People make their first feature and it doesn't do well and they stop. And um, I think if you have a fire, you shouldn't stop because um, it just means that your skill has not yet caught up with your ambition and your taste. And uh, I think it's important to keep going. Um, so that, you know, it took five years. I mean, you know, it's gonna take five to 10 years at least more than you think it's going to before you A, even get good, and B, achieve any level of success. And, you know, for me, just so you know, and I actually believe we all live in a town that really embraces this, but The Wise Kids was world premiering in Los Angeles at the Directors Guild of America to 900 people. We got a rave in variety, and we were like the talk of the town, and I came back the next week to answer phones at my receptionist job, <laughs> and, and did that for another year before I was even able to quit it. So, and to this day, any money that I make from The Wise Kids goes back to investors, like I don't make anything from it. <laughs> So it's like completely unromantic and it has to do with like it just like tremendous stamina and patience. And um, I've been so grateful to live in a town, unlike I think New York and LA, that encourages juggling, that encourages, <laughs> not literally, <laughs> um, but that'd be funny. Um, um, if there were like big like trib articles. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Just a juggling page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A juggling, the juggling section. It's like, <laughs> hey, do you have the juggling section? Have you seen it anywhere? Okay. Um, no, but I, you know, I think like we live in a town that embraces that and encourages the 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 mix of like a day job and art, and it doesn't judge you. And you know, th theatrically, we live in a town in which the same exact chief theater critic of the Trib reviews a Steppenwolf production, a Goodman production, and like a 20 seat storefront theater production. And that's sort of unheard of in New York and in Los Angeles. So I think we live in a very non-judgmental city and it's, it's sort of a big, great workshop space. I've always seen Chicago as just like a playground where you can do what you want and experiment and fail without judgment. And that's sort of what has you know, driven, driven me through the last decade I should say too, I don't, just to be candid with you, I don't like, I've also never felt like a spiritual kinship with like the blue collar Midwesterner thing, you know, because I'm a Southerner, I don't identify with the Midwest, I don't know what the hell's going on in the rest of Illinois, <laughs> I, you know, and, and so um, to me, the, that's nothing against the rest of Illinois, I'm sure it's beautiful. Um, I mean, I'm from South Carolina, come on. Um, uh, but you know, for me it's about, this beautiful community of artists. Um, we're like, one thing might not be that great, but that's okay, you're still brilliant, and just keep trying, like keep trying to do it. So, but that was just halfway through, and then I made Black Box, and, and, um, and then a couple more features, and just made something this past, shot a new feature this past summer called Henry Gamble's Birthday Party. Um, takes place entirely at a uh, questioning 17-year-old preacher's kids birthday pool party, and we shot that in Lake Forest. It's one house, one pool party, 24 hour period, um, sort of over the, just, just and 20 characters. So um, th I shot that this past summer. That's the new, the new thing. But that's a 10 year journey to like, finally feeling like I'm a filmmaker. And what a filmmaker you have become. Thanks. Um, 
You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll, on that subject, right, of Chicago, um, you certainly have had a plethora of, of wonderful Chicago talent in your film. I'm wondering if you could um, talk, as we were discussing before, that I feel, you know, a lot of students um, and a lot of filmmakers and, and, and stuff like that just in general fail on the level of, of casting. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your methods, your theories, you know, when you're casting a film. I mean, Black Box has, I think, spot on casting for, for certainly what, what I think you are going for and certainly the performances that were delivered. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and, and perhaps impart some, some, some tips and some wisdom on kids. Because I have students ask me all the time, you know, how do I get actors? You know, how do I find good actors and stuff like that? I don't think many of them really understand what's out there. Yeah, this is the sort of paradox to me of Chicago is that you have all these talented filmmakers. You, you're literally living in the best acting, you're living in like the acting capital of the planet Earth, you know? And that's like the London newspaper, the major London newspapers declare Chicago uh, better than its own community of actors. Um, there's a, a London theater critic who's constantly citing Chicago as, as containing the best actors in the world. And it's true. Um, I think, uh, oh God, this is so big. Um, <clears throat> so I've used casting directors, Pascal Rudnicki casting in town. All of you, please use them in the future and not the competition. I, then I got scared that someone was here. Um, <laughs> you saw the fear in my face. So if you're from an, I didn't mean. If you're from a com competitive casting agency, I, I don't mean, I didn't mean that. Um, anyway, Sorry, I got your back. Anyway, man. I use Pascal Rudnicki Casting, and they're um, a great casting agency. That um, they're sort of like they're made up of the most like some of the greatest human beings that I know. They love actors, they love people. Um, they cast, um, there's only three major casting agencies in Chicago. Um, Pascal Rudnicki casting, Claire Simon casting. The, they do all the features, the, bi the Hollywood things that come to town. And then there's O'Connor casting, which does a lot of commercials. Um, Marissa Ross is new, she cast How I Met Your Mother. She just moved to Chicago, so who knows what's gonna happen there. Um, but uh, so I've used casting uh, directors for uh, uh, Wise Kids, Black Box, and Henry Gamble's Birthday Party, and um, uh, that's amazing because you have access to the best actors in the city. They bring them all in. You see everybody. You get to pick your cast, and it's ideal. It's perfect. Before that, I made this film, this feature film called In Memoriam. It didn't really do go anywhere. It got reviewed by Roger Ebert which is somewhere, <laughs> but that was about it, you know? Like, we played, like, three festivals and had a Siskel run and got reviewed by Ebert. I don't know why the hell he reviewed that movie. Um, but he did, and it was, and we, I was reviewed by Ebert. Uh, Ebert reviewed In Memoriam and The Wise Kids within six months of each other. So I had two Roger Ebert reviews within six months, and I'll be grateful for that till the end. Um, but, did you ever um, get to meet him? I didn't get to e meet him, but we emailed a lot. Because um, we just, you know, two weeks ago we just screened that um, life itself. Yes, life itself. He and so while he was in the hospital, he was he watched Black Box in the hospital, or he wa or he watched. Wait, no, he watched Wise Kids while he was in the hospital. One of those things. Um, but I have emails from him where he's like, he would email me while he was watching and asked who was playing who and was tell comment on the performances and stuff. It was amazing. Anyway, what am I saying? Casting. Oh, casting. In right. memoriam. Um, in Memoriam is as good a cast as the others, but I had no casting director, no money for casting director, and that was just, I just pulled them, I just went to plays and did my research and read reviews and figured out who the best actors in Chicago were and asked them to be in my movie, and they said yes. So this is the thing, like, uh, there's never a reason to post on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> never? Um, well, like never, never. As or? a filmmaker, there's never a oh, reason okay, to post right. on, on Craigslist. Okay. Um, I mean, if you have like a sofa, you need to get rid of it. Um, sure. But a um, sofa. Uh, um, you all, I mean, you all have access to the, and you may hate theater. You may be like a film-only person. You don't like theater, but you also live in the the home of 
John Malkovich and Joan Allen and Gary Sinise and all these incredible people at Austin Wolf, Pendleton. Austin Pendleton. Um, and, you know, with very little effort, you could get their email addresses and ask them to be in your movie. And I would say, realistically speaking, seven times out of ten, they'd say yes. And uh, so you should just know that. I mean, I think, I say this as someone who's fallen way down on my, just because I don't have time a lot, but fallen down on my theater going duties. You may not like theater, but you also live in a town in which the houses are so small that you're not gonna get theatrical acting. You're gonna get film level, powerhouse, nuance acting um, in small, interesting companies. So I would stay on top of the like, you know, three and a half and four star Chris Jones reviews and see who he's praising and figure out who's out there because they'll do your movie. It's not like Chicago has like an incredibly rich film scene. It doesn't. And um, so that means you have access to, you know, I would credit a lot of my, I mean, I don't know. It's so weird. Oh my God, it's so weird. It's just like, What's weird, Steven? No, the lack of a Chicago, there's no Chicago new wave. There's no Chicago, there's no rich Chicago independent film scene. It's not happening. There's the makings of it, but, but, but you know, no, I mean, there's like individuals making stuff, but we're not, it's not like Austin. So basically, you know, just, you know, honestly, if we're just talking truth here, the independent film capitals of America right now are Brooklyn and Austin. You know, that's where, and Texas, even Dallas, you know, David Lowry made Ain't Them Body Saints out of Dallas. Um, so Texas and Brooklyn have got Chicago and Los Angeles beat uh, in terms of the independent film scene. Um, so, but there's a handful of, uh, more than a handful of people in Chicago making really exciting work. Um, it's not yet a community. We also lack a sort of central supporting agency. You know, um, Austin has Austin Film Society, massive amounts of money, Richard Linklater behind it. Um, you know, that there to support and nurture artists. You know, we don't have really anything like that. So, um, but what that means is, it's sort of your secret weapon. It means that then you have the power to sort of, you know, um, pull together resources in a town in which they're not being used up. You know, they're not being used by other people. So you can, you know, you can like boldly with, with great integrity and pride and dignity stand up and say, I'm a filmmaker making good films in this town. You know, do you want to help me make a great film? And you're in a town that is still searching for itself and therefore will empower you to be, to, to, um, to do that and to make something really special. Does that make sense? Um, it better. <laughs> so use it, you know? Use the fact that Chicago doesn't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? No, you're here. Um, so I guess, because um, we, we're sort of wrapping this up before we, we turn it over to the cheap seats. Um, oh, can I say one more thing? You don't need money to make these movies. And, and, and if you think you know how much you need or how many resources or how much money, you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you yes. that you can, um, you can achieve what you're trying to do for at least a quarter of what you think. At least. Maybe even a sixth of what you think. Um, you don't need anything. You really just need a couple of talented people to help you do it, you know? And, and be kind. You need kindness and creativity. You don't need all this stuff. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that is exactly what I, I was hoping that you would say. Um, oh, good. <laughs> um, at this point, I would love uh, to turn it over to the students who I'm sure have have a plethora of questions for you um, regarding the film or, or um, independent filmmaking in Chicago, more on that, right? So um, if any of you guys in the audience, you know, if you have questions, we got a microphone that's being set up right there by the spotlight, and you can stand over there and fire away uh, questions for Stephen Cohn. Um, just go ahead and line up. Don't all trample one another um, at the moment. Um, I guess while we're waiting for some, some people to file over there, um, Stephen, um, 
you mentioned like theater. Is there a specific theater group out there that you would recommend? Maybe you know that's a little bit more, you know, not the, the Steppenwolf for the Goodmans, but a little more off the beaten path that maybe you you really admire their work and and you'd like to maybe throw a shout out uh, recommendation to the students without maybe perhaps pissing anybody off or not mentioning. No, I mean no, I mean it's just like oh my god, there's too many theater companies. I mean there's just like hundreds of them and there's so many good ones. I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I don't see. I don't see much. Any, I don't have time to see much anymore. Um, oh God, uh, Steep Steep Theater is a is is like probably the most popular small theater. It's um, um, it's right off the Berwyn Red Line, right off the Berwyn Red Line. Um, very popular theater. Looks like we got a here. I'm gonna bail you out. Looks Great. like we got a question over here. Uh, <laughs> but I answered it. You did answer it. You did yeah. answer it. Hello, my name is Alex. Thank Hi, you Alex. for coming. You're welcome. Love the movie. Great. Um, Thank you. I used to be a theater kid myself, and it, it, I love black box performances, and it spoke to me. Oh, cool. Um, I, I want to ask you about. Um, I, I saw Wise Kids on Netflix, and it seems like you have this interest in performance. I felt like that the performance scenes, performance within the performance of the film itself, um, the scenes in Wise Kids where they were putting on the play, I'm a Jew, I don't know really, really know what it's called, um, yeah, the Jesus play. Um, um, yeah, it's, it it's like, a, like, like a passion play. I know why you don't play. know anything. Well, um, so it seemed like that's where the movie really sung and, and the characters were almost able to express the things that they couldn't um, talk about or were afraid to talk about. And yeah. definitely in this movie, there's a lot of that. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's so weird, I have no idea why that keeps happening. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, In Memoriam <clears throat> culminates, this movie I made before The Wise Kids, it culminates in a film, a shooting of a <laughs> film, in which people are playing real life counterparts. Ca they're playing real life characters on a college campus. Um, thanks for calling me out on that. <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't know. Yes, I have a genuine, interest in performance, but I don't know if it's, if, if it's an interest in performance or identity. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. I don't, I literally do not know. I don't know what my interest is. I know that I have an interest in people playing roles, but I don't know if that's because I come from like a repressive Southern upbringing in which everyone is playing a role, or if I'm literally interested in the, art, in the, in the act of artistic representation. It's probably a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I like layers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, I don't know. Layers was all you needed to say. Okay, layers. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I like when um, Jews like my films. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right, enough said, I can just walk out now. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier about <laughs> trying to create a very, the, the, the creation of the tone of this movie is very important to you. Mm. And I, I noticed particularly, I'm sure a lot of people here did as well, that the sound created and was massively important in the creation of that tone. And I would just like to know, at what point, perhaps from the very beginning, did you understand the importance that sound was going to play and how that understanding influenced the choices you made in the other aspects of production? Do you mean sound or music? Are you talking about the sound design or music? Uh, well, well, both. Both the music both. and the diegetic sound that, that was present. I knew that music would be everything. Like, I knew that music would define the film, which I also crossed my fingers that that, that wouldn't be a cop-out. Do you know what I'm saying? Because it's rare that that's... I mean, a movie shouldn't rely on its music. Why not? Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, ideally, um, you want your movie to, to function narratively, uh, whether, no matter what's going on, you know, you, you, well, there's this fear that, like, you don't want the music to tell people what to think or whatever. But I knew that the f music in this movie would be like wallpaper and would be as important as the black on the walls and, and the, uh, the feel of late winter, early spring. Um, and then sound design, uh, I knew, uh, music aside, I, um, it was post-production where I discovered how intensely the actual sound design aside from the music could 
I'd forgotten that I'd written a storm into the sex paint party building thingamajig, <laughs> and and I'd forgotten, and you know, and so bringing the thunder and the rain into that scene was was more vivid to me in post production than it was in the script writing. Um, so I would say music was always a sure thing, top of the list, part of the reason I even made the film to begin with. And then sound design, I was sort of reminded in post how what it could do. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. In my notes last night, and everybody just wants to, I'm sure at this point, see those notes. Um, no. <laughs> um, I, I wrote, in, when I was watching that scene, I just wrote, in vino veritas. <laughs> you guys, man, come on. Which scene? The, the whole storm paint party. Oh, thing. yeah, yeah. When they pull out the bottles of wine. Yes. Yeah. It's also the third movie, now I'm giving myself away, but like, it's also the third movie in a row that I've made where alcohol is a catalyst for liberation. And, uh, Which we all know is just entirely untrue. <laughs> it's just weird that I keep doing that. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, uh, Keith Nixon, uh, graduate student here at DePaul. Cool. And I was really impressed with the writing of the, uh, of the film. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? Yeah, I, I'm usually writing, um, I usually know, because I figured out a way to make these movies for manageable amounts of money, I usually know when I'm writing something that it is going to be made in six to 10 months. So that's exciting. So I'm literally writing something that I know I will shoot within the year. Um, and so that motivates, what you know, that actually gives me freedom to not fulfill a lot of screenwriting obligations. So I don't have to like do the stuff that's expected of me if I were, as if you know, I were trying to sell it. I don't know really how to write a screenplay that, to sell. Um, I'm sure it would be really terrible. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know, I write, like I already have a sense of what I want the movie to be. I usually struggle narratively because I'm not a plot person and I don't like plots and I don't really care about what's happening. <laughs> so so uh, I'm just trying to write a bunch of interesting things that will go together to make a good movie. So um, uh, I don't know. I just try to write people and try to write moments that if I were watching them, I'd be like, wow, this is really great. You know, there's that cliche of like, you want to make the movie that you want to see in the world, you know? And that's kind of what I do. But I do struggle to like, like I give my scripts to people. Like someone said about Black Box, I gave him the script and he was like, uh, he was like, maybe there should be an incident. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you mean s something that happens? He's like, yeah. <laughs> but I made it anyway. <laughs> awesome. Thank so, you. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and we're glad that you did. So, um, Stephen, if there is one last bit of wisdom advice, anything uh, with this wonderful audience that you would like to impart upon them before we wrap things up, um, now is the time to do it. So, is there any last thing that you would like to offer these 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 eager young minds moving out there in the world? Uh, I mean, I've, I hope I've said some things that will help you relax, because you should relax. Um, just chill out, it takes forever. Life is longer than you think. You know, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's fine, it's fine. Everything is fine. Just, just, you know, just like, do your thing, and, uh, and that it's fine. I'm. I mean, I'm like. I'm. I'm accessible. If you want to like contact me and ask me things, I, I'm happy to like be honest with you, and like help you if I can. I'm really accessible. Here comes uh, 75 emails tomorrow. Cone.steven at gmail.com. Well, there you have it. Everything is fine. Cone.steven. Everything is fine. One more hand Thanks. for Stephen Cone. Thank you very Thank much, you. Stephen. Thank you. <laughs>